Oh, hello. Can you hear hello. me, Larry? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I think so. So, hello, oh. Ray. Hello, Larry. So, Larry is going to uh, going to talk about just a second. Uh, sorry. Yeah, building a cloud-friendly application, right, Larry? Yes. He's like he's a director of development on platform.sh. Uh, so, Larry, you can introduce yourself, and after that, after your call, we can have like a, a quick Q and A. So, ready to share the screen? Just a moment. Uh, is there a way I can share stuff with the rest of the audience, or just the private chat? Right, right, right. You after you can share when you share it, you can share it with everyone. Okay, if anyone wants to follow along at home, there's the slides. Right. Yeah. If you if you just open your screen and share, you will you will be able to see it all. Right. I I'm gonna screen share as well. I want to make sure people also have a copy of the uh, slides if they want to follow along at home. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. So we'll share on the right. Uh, I think everybody able to see it. Just make a little bit. Okay. Uh, Are we a little bit okay. early? Late starting. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. You're a little bit early. And just for minutes, we're just having. We're just trying because we had like issues before with like uh, mm -hmm. other speakers, but we are we're ready to go as soon as we. As soon as we have it. Okay. So let me share the, the slides with everyone here. Then everyone can can have it okay. over there. And by the way, if you don't follow the Geekly pages, subscribe to official official page on Facebook, Twitter to be aware of the events. Uh, let me share. I'm just going to share to the people there. Just a minute. All right. So I think we we should be good to go. So I'm going to give the stage for you, Larry, and then we can we can start. Will be only just like two minutes early, but we can start. All right. So thank you. Enough. Should I go? Okay. So thank you everyone for coming. I uh, hope you can hear me. <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about cloud friendly applications today. My name is Larry Garfield. You may know me online as Krell. If you want to make fun of me uh, on Twitter during this talk, that's where you do so. I generally encourage it. I'm the Director of Developer Experience at Platform SH. We are a continuous deployment cloud hosting company. Uh, I'm also originally a PHP developer, not a Java developer. Uh, but what we're talking about here is language agnostic for the most part. Uh, but I am a member of the PHP FIG core committee. That's kind of the PHP's effective standards body and author of Thinking Functionally in PHP. It's a book on functional programming. In PHP, yes, it's actually a thing. You can do functional programming in almost any language these days if you put your mind to it. So let's talk about clouds. Wrong clouds, not those. All right. I mean cloud computing, actually. See, I mentioned this before that I uh, work at Platform SH which means that I work with a lot of applications, good and bad, uh, trying to get them to run on platform, on a cloud-based environment. And uh, I've seen some that are really good and some that, um, if you can't see anything nice, don't see anything at all. So I'm not going to mention them by name. <clears throat> but this is important because we keep hearing the importance of cloud stuff, cloud this, cloud that. You know, open cloud is taking over. Cloud native is the next big thing. You know, cloud-based hosting is where you need to be. OK, what does that mean? What exactly does cloud mean when we talk about cloud computing or a cloud environment or the cloud? What, what are we actually talking about here? There's actually two different questions wrapped up here. The first is, what is cloud computing? And the other is, what is the cloud? 
These are different things. They're different questions that have different answers and it's important to not get them confused. First up is the cloud. This is a marketing term. You've heard it described as uh, the cloud is just someone else's hard drive. That is true. The cloud means outsourcing. It's a marketing term for the business model of outsourcing technology to someone else's hard drive. We're not really getting into that. That's not the main focus of the talk today. What I want to talk about, though, is cloud computing. Cloud computing is a way to abstract away the physical infrastructure from your application. This frequently uh, means you're using the cloud, you're doing it on someone else's hard drive, but it doesn't have to be. You can do your own cloud computing on your own hardware in your own closet if you are so inclined, and it's still cloud computing. The idea here is that you have a logical system that is distinct from the physical system, the physical box. So you can think about your computer, you know, the, so the computer environment your application is running in as a logical construct that you can control entirely via software rather than a physical box you control with a screwdriver. You may have heard the phrase before that uh, with cloud computing and VMs, your systems should be cattle, not pets, so that you can just throw them away and replace them if you need to when you don't have to feel bad about it. Cloud computing enables that same concept for your application. An instance of your application is not a carefully crafted single instance you know, artisanal creation. It is a disposable artifact that you can throw out and replace or make more of anytime you need. And yet that application includes the entirety of its environment. So what makes an application cloud friendly or cloud native? What makes an application play nice in that type of system. What I want to share with you today are some guidelines, not hard rules necessarily, but some guidelines for making applications that play nicely in a cloud-based environment that I found make my life easier when I'm trying to set up random applications to run in our cloud-based environment. <clears throat> Now, some of the what I'm talking about here is going to use Platform SH as an example, but almost nothing I talk about here is platform specific. So this is true whether you're in Java or PHP or Node or, or Rust. It's true with Platform SH or with some other host. It, it's, the content itself is generic. First, split your code from your content. This seems obvious, but be surprised how often applications get this wrong. What do we mean by this? Well, what do we mean by code? Code is stuff provided by a developer. It has been carefully tested before it goes live because we're all doing automated testing, right? Mm -hmm. Its canonical version lives in version control of some kind. These days, almost always Git because you're all doing version control, right? Good. And at runtime, it is read-only. Code at runtime should not modify itself. In a compiled language, this is a bit harder, but in a scripting language, it's really easy to assume you can modify the code in runtime, in production, and that's a bad thing. Partially for security, because if the code lives on a read-only file system, it's one more layer of security preventing an attacker from being able to modify your code. It also provides good audit capabilities, because then code can't get into production. You can't just hot fix something in production by hacking it on the production server and then forget about that fix. And the next time you deploy code, it goes away. If the file system is read-only, you can't run into that problem. Content, by contrast, is stuff provided by users, usually ad hoc without any deep auditing or uh, testing process. It's canonical source of truth is either a database of some kind or on a file system. Could be a local file system, could be something like Amazon S3 or a remote file system, doesn't matter. And it is writable at runtime. At runtime, content can change. Therefore, you really don't want to confuse these two. Don't mix the file systems. That last set of lines there is the key. Your code should live on 
a read-only file system. Your content cannot live on a read-only file system. Therefore, you cannot use the same file system for code and content. And it's really easy to get this part wrong. Your application is disposable. Your data, however, is not. If your data is disposable, then you're not in production yet, you're just in staging. And you know, everyone has a staging server. Some people are lucky enough to have a separate production server. If you have some kind of production instance running and you're pushing new code to it, the data is already there. Your workflow looks something like this. You have source in Git, again, it doesn't matter what language, and you're pull, pulling and pushing from Git and working on updating code and whatever. And then at various points, either when your CI triggers it or manually, doesn't, again, doesn't really matter, you're going to take a snapshot of the code out of Git and run a build process on it. That build process could be downloading dependencies, compiling Java, compiling Kotlin, um, compiling SAS or less files into CSS, compressing your JavaScript, all kinds of stuff. The output of which is not an editable thing. It is a built artifact, which could be just a jar file. It could be a lot more than that, which you're then going to slot into your production environment, where there's already data waiting for it. Periodically, then, you will also take that data and snapshot it down to your development environment, all either all of it or part, part of it, so that you can test your new code against real up-to-date data to make sure there's no strange bugs in that. Note here that code goes one direction, data goes the other, and at no point do code and data follow the same pathway. They have completely different life cycles, and you really don't have the option of some in-between. So make sure you keep those things separate. Dev provided and user provided files, just the files on disk, need to be distinct from each other. And again, this is <clears throat> sounds obvious, but you'd be amazed the number of systems I've run into that try to put user configuration, user content, and uh, configuration provided by the developer in the same directory. Right there, you've lost because that one directory cannot be both read only and writable at the same time. Kind of by definition. I mentioned configuration a moment, a moment ago there. What is configuration? Is configuration content or is code? Well, does your configuration come from the developer or from an end user? Does it live primarily in Git or primarily in a database? Either one of these is fine. Really, there are perfectly good arguments for certain configuration to come from developers, and you're configuring your framework or your uh, CMS or whatever it is. There's other configurations you do want the end user to be able to configure through the UI, end user or administrator, same thing for our purposes. This is not usually an issue in bespoke custom applications, but in a pre-made application, it can be a huge problem. Because if the system is very, very configurable, you want to be able to stage those configuration changes and manage those through version control because, well, how otherwise you're just hacking production again. But if you do that, then you can't really modify it in runtime with a UI. You're modifying files because that's what you're putting to Git. Pick one. Again, I could make a very good argument for almost anything being either developer based or user based configuration. But trying to make something both is extremely hard. The most powerful example of this I've seen is the uh, Drupal 8 and 9 configuration management system. The way Drupal, Drupal is a popular PHP-based CMS, the way it works <clears throat> is most things are configurable through the interface uh, by an administrator and then stored in the database. However, they are designed in such a way that you can take a complete export of all that configuration to YAML files, dump that into a giant directory with thousands of YAML files, commit that to Git, deploy that code with those uh, exported files to production, and then run an import. 
and that updates all of the configuration at once. It works. It works decently well, but for the vast majority of cases, it is extremely over-engineered. The amount of code needed to make that work is enormous, uh, and there are only about 14,000 edge cases that it doesn't handle well. For the vast majority of cases, you are better off deciding where configuration comes from, where it originates, and being done with it. Is it code or is it content? It is one or the other. It cannot be both. Decide. Doesn't matter which one you decide, but you have to decide. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Next up, what happens at runtime stays at runtime. What does that mean, aside from a Vegas reference? Your application, we talked before about this application image, this build artifact you're, that you're going to produce. And you're then going to plug that into production where there is data waiting for you. OK, at what path is that data? Is that data files on disk, or is it data in your database that you need credentials for? Is it uh, your search index that's already in Elasticsearch or Solar or whatever? Are you plugging into your production environment, or are you product plugging into the uh, your staging environment, or your other staging environments, or one of your 17 staging environments? Are you running a multi-head system where you may have multiple copies of the application and one database? Or maybe you have some kind of failover happening with your database. You can assume none of these. Your application needs to be able to plug into its environment without making assumptions about it. And some of these assumptions are very basic that you wouldn't think are assumptions that you're making. Also, bear in mind, all upgrades in this model involve restarts. Your application is going to stop and restart every time you do an upgrade. Every code update involves shut down the server and make a new one, which means your restart process, your Buddha process, has to be fast. This is a place where Java sometimes struggles, depending on the application. Some frameworks do a better job here than others. A lot of legacy applications, if it takes five minutes, for your application to start up, that's five minutes of downtime every time you make an update. But that's how a cloud-based environment works. So you need to make sure your application has a short start time. You also need to dependency inject your environment. Everything about where your code is running and how it talks to other services needs to be not hard-coded, but passed into it at runtime. By environment, we mean database credentials which can include not just an SQL database, but whatever data stores you have. We could be talking about API keys, because you really don't want to be using your production API keys in staging for, let's say, your payment gateway. That's bad. Don't ask how I know this, but trust me on this. That's bad. Ideally, you as a developer never know what the credentials are for production APIs or production database or production search index. You never know the IP address that those live at, or their username and password. You shouldn't know. Any paths on disk, you shouldn't know, should not be hard-coded into the application. Relative paths are OK. A, you know, if you have an application root directory that is injected and provided by the system, then you can say, all right, relative to that path, I know this file is down this direction and this file is down this direction. That's OK. But you don't want an absolute path hard-coded in your code. I did once years ago inherit a system uh, that had a hard-coded paths from the production server all over it, which meant to work on the code at all on my own laptop, I needed to set up symlinks in my file system as root to fake out what directory it was living in. It was a mess. You don't want that. But also think about domain names. You have a production domain name. Your staging environment is going to be a different domain name. I hope your local development environment on your laptop is a different environment. Don't put these in the database because you want to sync the database between environments. These should be environment information passed into your application because if they are hard coded in code or in the database, then everything's going to break as soon as you move your code or move your data. How do you do that? How do you dependency inject your environments? Well, 
environment variables. That's what those are for. Every language has a basic API for doing that. Cool. You know, whatever uh, your specific language details are. Anything that is going to vary depending on where and how your application runs should be passed in through environment variables. But there's a catch. You may not necessarily control what those environment variables are called in the environment. You may want your database uh, username, let's say, to be uh, named db underscore user. But the server you're running on was configured db underscore username. One of you has to change, or really, you know, and that could be different on different hosts. One host may do it that way, another may give you a URL for the database, another may stick it into an array of some kind. That's going to vary depending on the host, depending on who set up the server, on what hosting service you're using. So you're going to need glue code. Doesn't have to be complicated, but there will, at some point, somewhere in your system, need to be some kind of glue code to map the host environment's environment variables to your environment variables. There's a lot of different ways of doing that, but you need to give yourself a place to do so. Every language is capable of this. It's usually fairly mundane. Uh, this is some older code for Symfony 3, PHP framework. In our case, with Platform, uh, we provide service credentials in a base64 encoded JSON blob in uh, an environment variable. That way, we can provide a lot of structure to it. So in code, you grab that environment variable, base64 decode it, run it through JSON decode, and now you've got a uh, data structure, and you map that into your application, however your application wants it. This is, if you don't read PHP, don't worry. It's fairly basic. Uh, just set parameter calls to set the variable that Symfony wants based on the data that is in that environment variable. We also now have uh, libraries that we provide that provide a nice wrapper around some of these environment variables. If you're a Go developer, it looks like this. I think you're mostly Java developers here, so I'll skip that. If you're in Java, uh, we have one there <coughs> where you can call uh, create a config object that uses that's a platform config called get credential formatted for MySQL. You get back the uh, database format that the uh, MySQL driver wants. The, the details of the glue code don't matter. It works for Kotlin too. Other hosts are going to have different mechanisms that all boil down to essentially the same thing. With In some cases, uh, you can just use a bash script that you source, and then that just sets up standalone environment variables. Your application can just read those directly. Many ways to skin this cat as long as you are still injecting this data at runtime. For local development, use .env. That's what it's for. There are a lot of .env libraries in every language. Take your pick. I don't care what you use, but use something. If you've not uh, used .env files before, <clears throat> the basic idea here is when your application boots, it says, all right, I'm looking for, you know, I've got my environment variables that are defined. I'm going to look for a file called .env on disk, which is just a key value pair and say, all right, these are environment variable defaults. If a given environment variable isn't already defined, use that. So for local development, I can have a .env file and just hard code in there my database host name and port and username and password and so forth. <clears throat> and since those are not defined in my local environment, then when I'm running my code on my laptop, it'll read that file and know where to talk to my local database. However, I have that set up with a local container or just install directly, doesn't really matter. In production, however, you do not have the .env file. Never, ever check your .env file into Git. That's not what it's for. In production, you're reading real environment variables from the system Unix environment. Also think about trusted domains. Many applications have uh, some kind of configuration. Details vary by application to <clears throat> let you say, all right, only accept requests if they're for the correct domain name. Because there is actually a security hole, an attack vulnerability, if you can send a message to a given server with uh, 
a hacked host header, then you can create a cache poisoning attack because the host header gets used to generate URLs. So a, ca a page gets cached with URLs generated by the application with the wrong host name in them. And that'll point users who click on those URLs off to some attacking evil website. So a lot of applications can say, all right, incoming request has the wrong host header, so I'll just throw it away and assume it's attackers. It's an attacker. That host name is going to be different on every application, every environment, production, staging, development, multiple uh, production heads. So you have to be able to inject that too. Do not put the database in the, uh, the domain name in the database where you run into all the same problems we talked about before. This also means if you're doing configuration via a static config file, stop. If you're configuring your credentials via some kind of static config file, be it YAML or any or properties file or whatever, that cannot do runtime execution to determine, OK, what are the credentials being injected into me? That is going to break. Do not do that. It also makes local overrides harder. <clears throat> but the big problem is you cannot make these dynamic. They cannot read from the environment. And a lot of applications get this one wrong, I've seen. Uh, especially older Java applications really, really don't give you a good way to uh, bypass your static, uh, some kind of static configuration file. The takeaway here, dependency inject your environment. That can take many forms. But if it's going to be different on production, staging, testing, local laptop, then pass it into an environment variable. That's the key. But specific kind of configuration we want to uh, be careful of, that's user configured connections, which mostly comes down to installers. Installers are the first piece of code you're up that uh, users are going to see in your application. So it's super important. But it's also really easy to get wrong. What does an installer usually do in an application? Well, it's going to ask for database credentials. It's going to ask the user for some basic information, site name, uh, time zone, stuff like that. It's going to write those credentials to a config file somewhere. It's going to set up your database tables, whatever data schema you have. And then it's going to write that basic site information either to a config file or to the database, and you're done. And this fails miserably in a cloud-based environment for all the reasons we've been talking about. Because anywhere it says write to disk, guess what? You can't write to disk in your production environment, in your cloud environment, because it's read-only by design. And you don't want to put your configuration for your database credentials into a file on you know, in the user upload directory. That's not secure. And as you said, the user shouldn't even know what these database credentials are. They're passed in. So that doesn't work either. You could say, well, install the application elsewhere and then upload it. But that's a really kind of terrible answer, because then your code doesn't actually work on a cloud environment. It can get hacked to work on a cloud environment. It's a different thing. Better design, a better way to build installers, pre-include the connection glue. Have code in there automatically that will read from the environment and say, oh, I already know what my database information is. I already know the, the uh, configuration credentials for my Redis connection. I already know, and so on, and so on, and so on. And or leave a place so that you can have a host-specific set of glue code to do that. Whatever that is, you have to have the installer be aware that that information may already be there. And if it's already there, cool. We don't need to ask the user. Wonderful. The installer should not be downloading additional code. It can download data, like translations or sample code or stuff like that, that gets stored to the database or uh, the user files directory, whatever. But code, you should not be downloading from the installer. Because when the installer is running, guess what? Read-only file system, you cannot install more code. This does get in the way of systems that try to do user-friendly self-updates, where you can just go into the admin area, push a button, and it updates its own code. That is intrinsically insecure. 
if you're running in a cloud-based environment, you know, if you actually want to do professional enterprise grade hosting, you can't enable that. That's just not acceptable from a security perspective. So a good installer assumes that you have, that it has no ability to write to disk, but it allows the environment to provide information to it so it doesn't matter. Also, another note here, I have seen systems that put database credential information and stuff like site name and uh, time zone and other configuration like that into the same big config file. Terrible. Do not do that. For the love of God, do not do that. Because then it's going to overwrite that file every time and therefore blow away your database credentials. Just no, that is wrong. Don't do that. I mentioned we're talking about cloud computing here, but I want to give one nod to the cloud, and that is to avoid lock in. You always need to be able to take your business elsewhere. This ability, the fact that you could move from one host to another, is how you keep your providers honest, even the ones you like. If you like Google, guess what? This is a partial list of products they killed off by as of 2015. That's the most recent list I could find. If you built a system that is dependent on one of these, then guess what? You are now dead in the water. Your, your application is now useless. All of these third-party providers that you're using have their best interest in mind, as well they should. You need to keep your best interest in mind, and that means being able to jump ship. Even if you don't want to, if you wouldn't like to, be able to. Easiest way to do that, free software. That's what, it, what it's here for. Always use services that you can replace. Any of the services you use could go out of business. They could change their pricing. They could change their terms of service in ways that you cannot cope with. And then if you can't go elsewhere, you are now dead. If your application cannot run without AWS Lambda, you are 100% dependent on Amazon continuing to like you. And that's bad. That is a business risk that you do not want to have. What's safe to use then? All of the standard open source tools that you're familiar with. All of these you could host yourself. You probably don't want to, but you could, which means you could also pay someone else to host it for you rather than hosting it yourself or hosting with just this one company. This allows competition and all that, you know, ca competition and capitalism to actually work. What doesn't? Any of these services that are specific to one company that you could not replace easily by swapping out a library and maybe taking a few things. I'm not saying you shouldn't use services. You should, if they help your application, go ahead and use them. But you shouldn't bind yourself to any of these as a dependency because that is a business risk. This is an outsourcing problem, not a cloud computing problem. It's not new. It's not created by cloud computing technology. But it becomes more into the forefront with cloud computing because you're going to be thinking about using third-party services more and more, which means your exposure to one of them changing their contract terms in ways that screw over your company is higher and higher. Avoid that trap. Only use tools you could host yourself which automatically gives you the ability to hire anyone you want to host it for you. Not because you can switch from MySQL to Postgres on a regular basis, but you can switch who is hosting your Postgres database for you. It's an important distinction there. And finally, we cannot talk about cloud computing without talking about microservices. Because, well, clouds are all about microservices, and you can enable microservices with clouds, and microservices of the future, and microservices this and that. And what are they? What is a microservice? There is no industry consensus yet regarding the properties of microservices, and an official definition is missing as well. Thanks. Thanks for nothing. So we can talk about kind of the properties a microservice design tends to have. And uh, this is kind of a, an amalgamation of Wikipedia and uh, some blogs by Martin Fowler from several years ago when he started using the term microservice. A microservice architecture is built out of single purpose components. Each of these components is, does one thing and does it well. And they communicate through dumb pipes, not through a custom protocol, 
They're communicating over HTTP, IPC, WebSocket, uh, some kind of generic protocol that anything on the other end could speak if it wanted to. Each of these pieces is built by separate teams. You don't have one team building five microservices. You have separate teams building each one of these microservice components. And therefore, they can all have their own independent releases. And you can release your new, the new version of your product catalog microservice independently of, without even talking to, the team responsible for the user authentication microservice. Effectively, every microservice treats every other microservice as if it were a third party. The fact that you were both paid by the same company is kind of incidental from an architecture perspective. Now, there are a number of benefits to this approach, absolutely. For example, you can use different tools and languages for different uh, components. You can use Quarkus for this piece and um, Tomcat for this piece and build your own custom Spring library uh, for this piece. And your front end website can be in PHP and still talking to a Java backend. Well, you have this other piece that's written in Go just kind of because, and that's fine. Each team can be small and focused, but it has to be interdisciplinary. It's not just developers. You have every team has developers, a project manager, or a scrum master, or whatever your model is, uh, potentially their own designer, their own architect. Each team is functioning as a complete entity unto itself. This gives you a very strong separation of concerns, which is usually a good thing. You can also scale and replace these things separately. If you decide, hey, you know, this product catalog that is written as microservice that is written as a uh, Java wrapper around an old COBOL system, we need to replace that with something built entirely in Rust. You can do that, and it's completely irrelevant to your user authentication system or your uh, payment gateway system or your web front end system. Essentially, we're leveraging Conway's law deliberately. Conway's law, for those who don't recall it, any organization that designs a system will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. If you've ever worked on uh, consulting websites, then you know every organization wants, is, or a department in the organization wants to have the, their name on the homepage in the menu. Not because it makes any sense from the user's point of view, but because, well, they're a department, so they get their own top-level menu. Usually this is bad. Microservice architecture is all about leveraging that pattern, leveraging that system, that effect, deliberately. But of course, there's a downside. There's actually several downsides. The big one, network latency. The time difference between calling from one class in memory to another is measured in nanoseconds. The time difference calling from one computer to another is measured in microseconds. Even if those are two separate containers on the same physical box, it's still more overhead to make a call than it is to uh, just call out another function in memory. Once you have a network, you have a lot more points of failure. Uh, yes, that's plural. Every single step along the way is a place for something to break, which means you're now looking at a random failure instead of once every billion function calls, once every thousand uh, API calls to another microservice. You have to deal with the fact that everything could break or any one thing could break at any given time. If you need to move code from one microservice to another, you're refactoring the whole system, that is substantially harder. It's not just a matter of moving your own stuff in your IDE, you actually have to rebuild a functionality in some other system from scratch because it may not even be in the same language. Even if you're only using JVM languages, it's still going to be a much higher lift. If you've ever dealt with API versioning, you know that there are three different ways of doing API versioning over, uh, on the web. All of them wrong, all of them broken, and everything hurts than dying. API versioning is a huge, massive pain in the butt. And if you're doing microservices, guess what? You now need that, and you have to think about that for every change you make, because you can't coordinate your release timing. You also need a lot more staff because every team, every microservice has its own designer, its own architect, its own project manager, its own developers. These are all separate teams and therefore you have more people involved. 
And you also have to think about per request overhead. This varies by language, but any language that uh, doesn't have a persistent process, things like PHP, Python, Ruby, are going to have extra boot up cost that they have to spend on every request. And if you're making five internal requests, that's five times as much start bootstrap time. Less of an issue in Java, but there's still a non-zero cost to having lots of extra HTTP requests internally every time you have an incoming request. Also, it's not very stable. If one of your microservices is going down means the others don't work, guess what? You don't have a microservice. You have a distributed monolith. That's not a good place to be. Honestly, if you're, you know, microservices have their place. If you're Google or Facebook or Netflix, then sure, or Amazon, then sure. A microservices architecture, a real microservices architecture can work out quite well. If you're not Google, Facebook, uh, Amazon, or, or Netflix, odds are doing co you know, architecting your system the way that they do is a bad idea. It's more, it's over engineering, it's more work than you're going to benefit from. It's just gonna make things more fragile. For most systems, I would argue a better approach is what I like to call a multimodal monolith. What is a multimodal monolith besides a mouthful? See, I made it through that. A multimodal monolith is a system built by a single team. There's one team working on it. It still is separated into discrete components, but you're gonna deploy all of them at once. They all get deployed in the same process. Usually, you're gonna end up writing it in one language. Not always. You could do it in multiple languages, that you, uh, that's okay. But it's much more likely, since it's a single team, that you're going to have a single language for it, or just JVM languages, potentially. <clears throat> and they can share data stores. In a microservices design, they're not sharing data stores with each other. So your user uh, management microservice has no way to talk to the database behind your product catalog because it doesn't even know what that, ser that data service is. In this case, it's OK for them to all talk to the same database because they're all part of the same system. And honestly, you've probably all done this at some point already without realizing it. What are some examples here? Cron jobs. Cron jobs are a different mode that your code base runs in that does stuff out of band. <clears throat> that stuff could be all kinds of things, but you still have a single code base that just runs the cron job pathway and does so separately from main requests. If you have a queue worker of some kind, then it can be developed together. They can share the same backend Hibernate code. They can talk to the same database. That's fine. But it's a separate process running that is <clears throat> chewing through your queue when some other part of the system is putting data into the queue. A lot of applications have a separate admin area. This could be a separate mode that you run your, your program in. It could be a separate entry point. Uh, if you have a single copy of the application, if you have separate entry points that then gets its own thread or its own process, depending on your language. But again, it's a separate uh, process, usually. Or many systems will have a separate API segment of the application. Still the same code in the back, but <clears throat> you'll have a website, and then you'll have the application that controls the API for the website. Very common if the API was added after the fact, after the, the website was built. And then, again, they may share a lot of the same backend code, but it's a separate request. These could be all a single code base, or there could be multiple code bases that you put into the same Git repository. They could be on separate containers. You can scale these independently. The admin application is a great example where you take a single application build, that same build artifact we talked about, and you spin it up once with an environment variable that says run in admin mode. And then you have a container that runs the admin version of your application on a given path. <clears throat> and then you have that take that, that, that same artifact, that same build image, that same exact code base, and run it in a different container with an environment variable that has run in user mode and spin up five of those 
And so now you have five copies of your user application, one copy of your admin application, all of which are the exact same code base, just with different runtime settings. Which means when you make an update, you are automatically updating the code base for both admin and user at the same time. You don't need to worry about them going out of sync. There's no extra API version that you need to worry about because you're going to update the whole thing all at once. Now, what do all of these have in common? All of these examples of multimodal monoliths, what do all of them have in common? They all break on asynchronous boundaries. A given web request for a user still only talks to one application process. A separate uh, request for the admin is a separate process. The cron is a separate process. The queue worker is a separate process, which means if one of them temporarily goes down, that's OK. Incoming requests, you know, web user requests can still happen even while you figure out why the queue worker died. And then when you restart the queue worker, it will catch up eventually. But any given request from the user is not going to block on, oh, wait, the cron is down. No, you don't have that problem. Or, oh, wait, the admin system is down. I, I don't care. Each request only touches one service and does just the work that, that one service needs to do. This is still a bit more complex than a traditional monolith, but for the vast majority of users, the cost uh, for benefit trade-off here is way better than for really going all the way on microservices. You'll get more bang for your buck, a lot less uh, opportunity for weird bugs by not trying to pretend that you are Netflix. In summary then, if we could summarize everything about writing cloud-friendly applications into a single slide, it'd be this. Remember what they say when, when you assume. Don't assume the environment your code is running in. Don't assume the number of web heads your application has. Don't assume what the connections are for your, uh, your data stores. Don't assume what your API keys are. Don't assume what domain you're going to be running on. Don't assume your code base is going to be writable or any part of your system is writable at runtime. Don't assume that third-party services you rely on are going to exist forever. They may not. Don't assume that you are big and complex enough to need microservices. You're probably not. But by allowing your system this kind of flexibility to have its environment injected into it so your application is dumb and unaware of a lot of these things that are going to vary from one environment to another, you can get a way more flexibility to deploy your application any number of ways, scale it any number of ways, upgrade it any number of ways. And that is what cloud computing really offers if you do it right. Thank you. Again, my name is Larry Garfield at Krell on Twitter. Uh, more information, you can find me there or Platform SH uh, also on Twitter. <clears throat> Uh, we do host Java, among many other languages. And if you also do PHP on the side, go buy my book. And happy to take questions. Thank you, Larry. That was an awesome presentation. I'm going to go over the questions that we have here on the Q&A. Let me see what I have here. Um, first question, could you make a naive example of your database YAML configuration? I think that's not like a uh, valid one. Let me see other. Okay, uh, how do we control, how do we control the visioning of the configuration files? Saying the files which are the environment variables. Supposing that we are adding new, va new variables which need to have a value in a different, on. In different each uh, need uh, sorry in the uh, needs to have a different value on different each environment. So somewhere in your application, uh, there's many ways to skin this cat. But somewhere in your application, you have somewhere you're going to ask, okay, what are my database credentials? Okay, what are my um, API keys? What are my um, yeah, the, the day of the week that I want to, to start in or something, something that you do want to change depending on 
your environment. Wrap all of it up in one place, and that one place reads from an environment variable, and that one place also uses uh, a .n file, so it can read a .n file in case the environment variable is not set, and you're done. I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but essentially that's the, the idea. Um, de depending on your application, you could just call system get env yourself. You probably want to wrap it better than that. Uh, I know a lot of systems will, the configuration for their dependency injection container or their service container will read from the environment and inject those values in there so that they get passed to services as they start up. Uh, that's very common in the PHP space. I don't know if that's common practice in Java, but you certainly can do it that way. Um, but ha have some central place that you're reading from the environment that also handles the .env override. All of the code just asks that that particular system, uh, library, that particular class, and trust it. All right, so the next question here is, um, <clears throat> see, how do we control the versioning of the configuration files, say the files which are environment variable? Uh, versioning of variables that are environment variables, you don't version those. And I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, the, the, there is another uh, complement here. So supposing that we are adding a new variable that needs to have. OK, so your code will be updated to you have a, new, a new subsystem that uses a foo variable, or let's say um, you're adding PayPal support. And so you need to uh, be able to read from PayPal API. OK, then you update your code to look for an environment variable named PayPal API. That's just normal code like any other code. You check that into version control like anything else. And then in local developments on your laptop, you use a .n file, which does not go in version control. And you put in a testing API key. On your production site, you update your production server configuration so that it has a, um, a PayPal API environment variable with whatever that value is supposed to be. And the code will read it from there. That, that is the idea. Things that are going to be different between production and your laptop do not go in version control. That is the important takeaway here. Things that are going to be different depending on what environment you're on should not be version control because the version control is for things that are the same in every environment. All right, so one question, another question here is, let me see, how Agile teams are working with multimodal monolith project between uh, versus microservices in terms of branches, strategies, pipelines, CICD, and isolated test dependence? Uh, how, how do you do like the team management for that? Is that the question? Yeah, yeah, that's the question. That's the general question. It's at that point, not very different than a traditional monolith. And that's kind of the benefit. Um, if you have a CI process that periodically checks out and builds the code, that's the same. You're checking out and building the code. If you have multiple applications in the same Git repository, which is a common way of doing it, um, again, same language or different, then cool, you check out those two separate directories, compile them separately, and spin them up in separate containers. You do that in production, you do that in testing, you do that in staging, do that on your local laptop. It's just the same process in all of them. This also means all of these can have their own tests. You need a very minimal amount of cross-mode uh, tests, maybe a, a few, but not even that, because you're, you're never going to have a request that hits the user front-end application and then that makes a request over to the queue. You may have a test that user app, uh, user request happens and it's supposed to enqueue something, but then what you're testing is, okay, does this application enqueue something when this user event happens? And you can mock, mock the uh, queue server, RabbitMQ, ZeroMQ, Beanstalk, whatever you're using, doesn't matter. And <clears throat> yeah, that, that's your mocking boundary. So one of the advantages, you never actually need to worry about 
oh, I need to spin up copies of all eight of my microservices and then test that a given user request hits all seven that it's supposed to, because that doesn't happen. So you don't need to test for it. So, yeah, there's a complement for that question. Yeah, there's a complement for that question saying, does it uh, does impede agile ways of working, like being multi multiple disciplinary teams, doing <coughs> using the multi-model monolith approach? With a multi-model monolith, you have a single team building it. They're working on the same Git repository usually. Um, and if you're using all Java or all Scala or all Go or all whatever, then cool, you have a team that knows how to write in that language. If you're using a, a mix, then your team needs to know how to use both languages. But you have one project manager that is then responsible for that whole application, one architect responsible for that application, one team responsible for that application. And the fact that you sometimes run the application in cron or as a queue process is kind of secondary. From a management perspective, it's a monolith. That's the point. You get all of the simplicity of having a single team rather than a big a uh, distributed team of lots of different people working on different pieces, you have a single team that can take care of it. The, you know, you're explicitly not getting the overhead of microservices, which would be you have five project managers who have to make sure they coordinate and usually fail at it because that's hard. And one last question here is um, about legacy, if it's legacy applications should be moved to cloud. From your perspective? It depends on the legacy application, how easy it is to make it do the things we just talked about, um, how easy it is to, you know, to inst uh, install it again, um, how easy it is to rewrite it. There's a lot of factors there. I would say the first thing you should ask is why? What benefit would I get from shifting this application from whatever it is now that's working to a cloud environment? It could be there are no benefits, and you would just be doing it for techno fetishism, in which case, don't. If it works, leave it where it is. On the other hand, it could be you want to be able to redeploy it six times a day as you have new code releases. You want to be able to have that rapid deployment, and you can't do that on it where it is right now. Then that's a perfectly good reason to say, all right, I want to be able to do that kind of rapid deployment, so I'll switch to a cloud environment, and then, all right, what do I need to change in my application in order to do that? OK, how hard is that going to be? And depending on the code base, that could be really easy, or it could be rewrite it from scratch. It's going to depend widely on the application. Um, mostly, it's going to come down to, in my experience, it comes down to Read-only file system, startup time if you're when you're talking in Java, uh, and not putting variable, not, not putting your configuration into static files you cannot uh, bridge to environment variables. Those are the big three things I find that applications get wrong, especially older applications. On your particular application, you're going to have to look into that. If it's easy to swap out a properties file for code that reads from environment variables, and then everything's happy after that, cool. You can cloudify it in an afternoon. If the entire application is built in such a way that it takes 10 minutes to boot, that's a harder sell, because then that whole knock it over and break, uh, put up a new one gets a lot harder. You might be able to do blue-green deployments with it, uh, in which you deploy a new version of the code on a separate container, boot that up, and then redirect requests over to it. So you have no downtime. But that only works if you have no uh, required data schema changes. If you have data schema changes you need to make, then you can't really do blue-green deployment. So there's a lot of trade-offs you have to think through in your application. And for a legacy application, it could be anywhere from, this is really easy, let's do it, through this is impossible, it's just not worth the effort, and anywhere in between. But the, those are the things you want to, to look at in terms of figuring out if it's worth doing.
All right. So I think it was the majority of our questions. So you have your context here on, on the last page. Uh, I mean, the plan, already, I already shared the presentation with the chat. So I mean, they were able to get that. So thank you, Larry. It was an awesome presentation. And uh, I'll, also, I'll also be hanging around in the Slack channel for a while if you have questions there. Thank you. Take care. You can. Bye.